Hello, welcome to Evolved Nest Explained. My name is Dr. Darshan Arvais, and I'm here with Mary Tarsha, and we're both at the University of uh, Notre Dame, Department of Psychology in the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. Hi, Mary. Hi, Darsha. Today, we're discussing one component of the nest, self-directed social play. And let me just say a few words about nestedness. Humans evolved to be nested, and the nest for young children helps optimize children's development, their thriving and resilience and good health in adulthood. And what do we mean by child thriving? Well, it includes physical health, happiness and well being, self acceptance and self confidence, self control, emotional intelligence, sociality and social skills, empathy, perspective taking kindness, and active curiosity. Nestedness throughout life supports thriving for all ages. Adults who are thriving look like this. They have quiet minds, the ability to be emotionally present. Uh, they are innerly happy and exhibit childlike glee. They are vital, have an abundance of electricity in their bodies. They listen unconditionally to others, to other opinions, are okay with difference and diversity. They have empathy and respect all for other people, but also for nature. And they are, are authentically helpful towards others. They keep their personal vision, their unique gifts uh, uh, growing and being shared with others. They look and are fully alive they're aware of the sacredness of life, and they exhibit love, compassion, and forgiveness. So those are the aims of the Evolved Nest for all ages, and that's what we talk about in general across our web pages. And here today we're talking about self-directed social play. You wanna talk about the nest here? This is our big picture, Mary? Yeah, so we've been taking time to discuss each component of the nest. And so uh, to begin with, the first one is soothing perinatal experiences, on request breastfeeding, positive moving touch, no negative touch, lots of affectionate touch, positive in climate, climate where the child feels welcome. And this is what we're talking about today, self-directed social play, the importance of allo mothers or other caregivers in addition to mothers and fathers, responsive relationships. It means responding to the needs of the infant and child when they need it. A sense of connection to the natural world and routine healing practices. And so this is what every child needs to thrive in order to reach their potential. And today we're talking about self-directed social play and how important this is, as Darsha said in the beginning, when you have nestedness, nestedness across the lifespan supports de human development and supports uh, for all ages. And this one is particularly true. So social play is important for children, but for all ages. And it heals you as an adult. If you didn't play as a child or if you have trouble being flexible and attuned to others or are depressed or dysregulated, playing helps heal your brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is why it's so important. So it's important to have that in the beginning of life, but also for all ages, all the way grandparents on up. That's right. It's an ancient uh, aspect in the animal kingdom, phylogenetically ancient. Many mm -hmm. species demonstrate play behaviors from sharks and fish to turtles, lizards, and birds. In nature, free play among animals builds a sense of belonging to place and biophilia and attachment to uh, the natural world. Mm -hmm. Yes, so you see here that play is so natural. I think that's the big takeaway from this slide. You know, it's how we are made, how other species are made, but it's what we're really made for. And what about social play with um, different age groups, Darsha? Right, so that's our heritage in our ancestral context, small band hunter-gatherers, which we spent 99% of our human genus history in this kind of society or organization. 
And in those societies, social play occurs with multiple ages. So you're hanging out with other, I mean, there aren't that many kids your same age when you're a child. And then you, you play with adults, among adults. It's all about playing and enjoying life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it builds self-regulation, which is the ability to do what you desire to do in the moment, right? Directed behavior. It also helps you um, regulate your emotions, which is really important. And so, you know, we all have different um, feelings and emotions or mood swings, but you're able to then regulate that and also able to adapt, have this adaptiveness, which we talk about uh, throughout this whole presentation, but how important that is to be able to uh, change and be flexible. So this all happens through social play. And the, the, uh, uh, one of the mottos of the Marines is adapt and overcome. Ah. You're able to do that when you have a flexible brain. Mm -hmm. I used that as an adolescent. That was uh, kind of a key motto for me. <laughs> Learn wow. <to> along. <laughs> That's interesting. So here's a phylogeny of all the major vertebrate animal groups. And the ones where you can see play are the ones that are, have a black square or a rectangle. And then the kind of um, unclear, uh, it has a kind of a mixed band uh, square, and then it's not known uh, for the white square. So you see all sorts of animals play. That's a great slide. Mammalians are our heritage also, we're mammals and mammalians, animals, children, uh, young youth play. That's what they do. They play, 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 play almost all the time, uh, other than sleeping and eating. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's, some great, there's some great references here, you know. Um, my, I first think about play like, well, what, you know, that's meaningless. Like what's really happening during play? But, you know, neuroscientists like Jak Ponsef and others here that we have cited, you know, have spent decades researching what's happening when play is going on. And so much is happening in building of the brain and growing parts of the brain that we'll talk about a little bit later that are so important to thriving and to wellness. But it's very interesting, I think, just to realize that uh, this decades and decades have been dedicated to just understanding what's going on and how play is so helpful and effective. Yes, yeah, so those decades of studies have been mostly with other animals, uh, but then now recently play studies in humans are becoming more prevalent and mm -hmm. finding similar outcomes which we'll talk about. And it's not just the scientists that thought play was important. Plato, if you uh, like philosophy and you like the ancient Greeks, he also thought that this was important, that from their earliest years, children must take part in all the more lawful forms of play. Otherwise they can never become well-conducted and virtuous citizens. So again, uh, probably in part because that allows you to be flexible and attuned to others and uh, compromise and negotiate. Those are all kinds of things you might have to do in play. I mean, talk about converging evidence, Darsha. You know, I mean, <laughs> here, I mean, that's what we like to see in science, right? We see converging evidence from across different studies, but here you have over um, many, many, many years, people observing like Plato, the importance of play and how, how important it is for wellness. And so I, I just love that. And back to our uh, ancestral context, small band hunter-gatherers, Peter Gray has done extensive work examining playing among them. And he notes that it promotes bonding and peacefulness, peaceful mm -hmm. cooperation. And there's teasing, but it's not put down humor like we see on a lot of television shows uh, or movies. It's teasing in a kind of humorous way uh, to keep the ego from getting too big, right? Thinking too much of yourself. Um, and they have peaceful societies. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, I think we've talked about this other places of how it's for building a humble disposition, right? So when you're teasing and joking and you're in relationship back and forth, it does help deflate the ego. <laughs> yes. So self-directed social play is good for all ages. And the kinds of things it does is promote or facilitate emotion regulation, so your ability to control your emotions and not, not having them take you over, which the Greek, ancient Greeks were very worried about. They called that passion. 
uh, and then it influences all sorts of gene, genes in their expression uh, in a positive way and fosters brain growth development. Yeah. The, re uh, the references are all at the end of this, in case you want to look these up. You want to talk about this, Mary? Oh, sure. So, you know, we keep talking about how this promotes self-regulation and emotion regulation. And so how, how does that happen? So what, what is taking place, so we've understand so far, is that play really helps develop the right hemisphere. And we know that the right hemisphere, the left and right, the, you know, the brain has two hemispheres. And broadly speaking, they have different functions, but of course they integrate with each other through the corpus callosum and communicate. But, and you need both of them, obviously. But the right brain is really important for self-regulation and emotion regulation. And it's important for inner subjectivity. So being able to be aware of what you feel and what other people feel. And it's part of emotion intelligence, empathy, the sense of beingness, transcendence, higher consciousness. So all of this is part of the right hemisphere and play develops this <laughs> and also play can regrow it. So that's what's really exciting. But it's important to know that the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere don't develop in early life at the same rate. So the right brain is developing more rapidly within the first few years of life. And so that's why it's so important to let children play, to provide opportunities um, to play and to really encourage that. And it's interesting, uh, the right hemisphere is really important for well-being in terms of not getting being depressed or obsessive. So uh, obsessive compulsive people tend to be too focused on detail and they can't get away from that. And depressed people tend to be too focused on the big picture, you know, how awful everything has been or is going to be or something. And uh, a well-functioning brain moves uh, according to what the situation is, is able to move into the big picture or the little picture and flexibly attune to the situation. And what happens when you don't have that self-regulation, the ability to do that, you get stuck. You get stuck in uh, obsessiveness or uh, depression, you know, or other disorders, so. Yeah, and it's exciting that play can help with that. Yes. So what's play about? Well, it's fragile because when you feel afraid, <laughs> angry, or scared, you don't really wanna play and you don't play. And if you feel a uh, pain or hungry or uh, you're sick, again, uh, you don't really want to play then either. And so it seems, and this is what the research among the, with the animal um, studies over decades have shown, that it, you really need a sense of safety to play. So it's actually a good signal of how safe the person is feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. So it is robust also because when young mammals are feeling fine, uh, they're going to play. So what they do when they get together, right? It's easy to make friends when you're a kid because the other kid wants to play too. <laughs> yeah, so the relationship between safety and security, feeling good and play, they're all interwoven with each other, right? Right, yes. So you can't force play. <laughs> right. So that would be a takeaway, right? So yeah. what does play do for you? It has all sorts of epigenetic effects and growth effects. So neural metabolism increases in the neocortex, your thinking part of your brain, your, uh, the brain um, aspect that collects information, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. Most, uh, many of the genes, one third of 1200 that have been studied so far, are modified rapidly by play behavior. So remember that epigenetics occurs in the moment depending what you're doing, as well as in early life, things are, there's sensitive periods for certain genes to be turned on or off. And if you get the right experience, the nurturing experience, those things get set properly and you can't really change them much later, but there are other kinds of gene expression that occur in the moment. So when you go to bed, certain genes are turned on. Uh, and when you get up, other ones are turned on. So it's an ongoing flexible system that we have and play turns on good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how important that is. And what about dopamine? That's really important for yes. feeling well, yeah. This is the energizing hormone that's secreted during play. It's, it's this uh, related to feeling positively 
anticipating, you know, anticipatory euphoria. And play does that to you because you don't know what the your playmate, this is rough and tumble, physical play, creative, imaginative play. You don't know what they're gonna do next, you know, and, oh, and it's so exciting. And then you have to react. It's like, you don't know how you're gonna react either because you don't know what they, so it's a just a really uh, immersed kind of way to get the dopamine system uh, energized well. When you play a lot in, in childhood, then you're again, setting up your kind of personality for play, your personality for how much you're gonna be socially uh, connected. And so we want to give kids lots of opportunities for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it makes you, uh, it is, it's part of the bonding system too, dopamine. And so it increases pro-social behaviors, but it also helps you feel more bonded, increase that sense of connectedness and belongingness. And what about for children with ADHD? Well, Pancept uh, has argued, argued for many years that uh, ADHD or maybe a signal that the child's not getting enough play time. That means rough and tumble running around play time because that's what the body needs to grow well. And so they'll be restless sitting there if they're forced into a desk at school and supposed to sit there and listen to something they're not interested in. Uh, that's gonna manifest itself as with symptoms that adults call ADHD. And some kids need more play than others. And so even if, they're getting some play, they might need more play and they may be play starved actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's better to try using play first rather than a pill. And actually Yakupangsep called uh, Ritalin, one of the drugs used for ADHD, play in a pill. Yeah, very important, very important. So a lack of play then is gonna lead to all sorts of things. You wanna tell us about those? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so we do know, you know, one of the ways we study things is looking at what happens when you have a lot of something and then also what happens when you're deprived. So both of those help us understand the importance of a specific variable. And for play, we see that lack of play is related to difficulty regulating aggressive urges and also is related to altered behavior in a variety of ways that altered social, sexual, and conflict interactions with peers. And as we said before, it is related to and associated with ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorders. And even it, there's a relationship with academic achievement, which when we go back and thinking about how the brain, how play really supports brain development, then that finding makes sense. And again, also increased aggression. So there's a lot of um, uh, evidence here for when you have play, it's promoting all of the positive things and diminishing negative things. But with lack of play, we see that a number of different disorders start emerging problems. Uh, speaking of academic achievement, there's a book called Spark, uh, which is about uh, studying various uh, school-based interventions where they used play to see if it would affect academic achievement. And in, in one um, study, I remember they had low achieving students in two different classes. And one of them got to play right before class and the other one didn't get to play as much or something. Uh, and this, this is self-directed play that they had um, Fitbits on or something. And they had to go to a gym with all sorts of possible activities like climbing walls. And they, they would have to keep um, a certain number of active moments or something um, to count. And they found that the students that had play right before class, uh, their scores just soared in the literacy or I can't remember exactly what they were studying, I'd have to look it up. But uh, anyway, so play has an actual effect on the brain's ability to learn. Mm. Uh, and so you wanna play as much as possible uh, to actually enhance your academic achievement. Mm. Yeah, wonderful, that is wonderful. And you know, also we, we see that with um, like other countries that increase play like Finland, right? That uh, in their younger years in school, they're outside every 45 minutes playing, you know, and uh, one of the interviewers asked how, you know, Americans asked, how do you ever get the kids to do anything? You're going outside all the time. And the teacher said, 
how would you get them to do anything otherwise? <laughs> right? So they understood going outside, playing, and then come back, coming back inside and learning. We're going hand in hand. And the Finnish schools have the best achievement scores in the world. Yes. And they only test in high school. They don't do the testing constantly through the elementary school years or primary school years. So uh, there's something to say about their way of doing things. <laughs> How about in the States? Tell us about that, Mary. What's happening well, in the United States? Yeah, unfortunately, the status of play in the US is on the decline. So we see that physical play in kindergarten is really disappearing. And um, we see that you know, educators often have difficulty distinguishing play from aggression or um, and are uncertain about how to manage these urges in children. And I know just from, from my own experience at conferences and um, interacting with others who go study play and you know, they will talk to kindergarten teachers and look at the schedule and say, you know, we want to look at how much time you're playing and the teachers will say, you know, we, we don't do that. <laughs> it's just not there. So unfortunately, this is on the, on the decline. There's a good movie, uh, a few years old, called The War on Kids. And they have a segment about this inability of adults to recognize play um, urges um, and kind of the treatment of them with uh, detention and other punishments. So why is it that adults resist playing? Uh, Blattner and Blattner uh, discuss this in their book on play, The Art of Play. And they uh, go through the reasons that they found. They've done decades of research with uh, sociodramatic play groups, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But this, these are the kinds of resistances they have noted. I'm used to a narrow range of accepted behavior. I mean, you know, this is, if you ask them, this is how the psychologist would interpret what they say, okay? They wouldn't use these words exactly, but, or I'm shy or uncomfortable in group settings. I'm depressed. Uh, my play experience was competitive or structured, or I'm, I'm not, I don't know how to sing or do dance or drama, or I feel awkward when others are more playful. So these are the things that you know the, the makes the adult shrink away from playing because of this kind of um, background. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just with the first one about the narrow range of accepted behavior, there is a creativity in play, you know, and so you don't know what's going to happen or what's going to develop, and that's a very fun and an exciting thing. But it, it could be threatening if it's outside your range of accepted behavior, you know? Because your brain has not um, been raised to be that flexible, perhaps, right? So these are the long-term effects of not having enough play yourself. And so play is still unacceptable. Uh, again, the resistances are these kind of psychological um, aspects of not wanting to feel vulnerable or needy, you know, because you need your partner to respond or to be ignorant to show that you don't know something or to make a mistake. Oh my God, a mistake, right? Uh, and then, or to show qualities of the opposite gender, which usually is um, guys uh, of anything feminine, right? If they start singing, oh, that's too girly or whatever it is, or the fear of being silly because that's not what the culture has promoted. So that's part of what the second part of the slide here talks about is the history, and this is particularly in the US, but Western cultures generally and other ones, uh, where you denigrate the energy of young children. So you try to tamp them down, you know, make them sit in their seat at school, you punish them for uh, being exuberant instead of, you know, allowing that flow of energy to, you know, be creative with others. And then even uh, spoiling children which is this notion um, uh, that you don't want to give them too much pleasure. Uh, so you want to shut them down again uh, and make them learn to just exist in the world and do their work, you know, very puritanical ways of looking at kids and what's appropriate behavior. Uh, and that's also infused in our ideas of what's acceptable as an adult. You know, play, because that's not 
you're not being responsible if you play. And then the dualistic thinking that kind of governs our society, how things are either good or they're bad, the true or the false, or they're adult or childish, rather than the gray area. Most everything is really a gray area. Uh, and you know, it's the situation that calls for particular behavior. Uh, and that's that flexibility to be able to recognize when to play and you know how to play and with whom to play and all that flexibility is not dualistic. Mm -hmm. You know, and just thinking about the, fir the first one here with the cultural pattern of trying to suppress the energy of young children, thinking about how, you know, we don't talk about um, experience of nestedness leads to thriving and part of thriving is the quiet mind of an adult. <laughs> and so you really see this opposite, you know, by trying to contain or control the energy of young children, it might be the intention that you're thinking the outcome is this adult of a quiet mind, but it's actually the, the opposite of what you're doing, right? So allowing and supporting this energy and opportunities for play will eventually lead, you know, to that quiet mind as an adult, but they need to express that energy. We all need to express that energy, right, from time to time. So the quiet mind uh, characteristic refers to that emotion of being present, emotionally present. And so play teaches you to be emotionally present. You can't, your play partner is not gonna play with you if you start thinking about, you know, next week, you know, <laughs> grocery list. No, you gotta be there in the moment, right? And so that's part of that quiet mind. And remember too, that adults, uh, the thriving adult, plays, you know, with childlike glee. So it's that nice combination of being here with you, emotionally present and connected, and having fun with it, right? So uh, again, that's the flexible uh, ability and capacity that we we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. So here are the Blattners um, talk about sociodramatic role play. This is a form of actually, it's good for healing any kind of uh, trauma that you've had, if it's really severe trauma, you, you need, of course, a, a therapist's help, uh, typically. Um, so this is for, you know, mild trauma, perhaps, and um, getting yourself kind of back tuned into a group and socially uh, open. And it's also helpful for preventing mental illness, the, the depression and the loneliness that's so common now in the United States. Mm -hmm. And adult play groups, but this is, you know, something that the whole family can do together, you know, and so for adults engaging with their children and, and um, you know, doing the sociodramatic play, it's so beneficial for the children, but it's so beneficial for the adults as well. It's just family therapy for everybody. Yeah, and social dramatic role play means that you kind of just take on a role. Okay, I'm going to be the Queen Victoria. And, um, and then other people volunteer to be, you know, I'll be your, your uh, maiden, your handmaiden or whatever. Your, I'll be the noble knight. Uh, well, this is I'm crossing uh, <laughs> historical periods. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> do whatever you want. I'll be your lap dog. <laughs> and then you act it out and then you go through, you know, and, and they have different ways to get into it. You know, you start with just taking on a character. Who do you want to be today? And it could, or what animal, or what what um, historical figure, or what member of your family do you want to act out? You know, so you get to play roles, and then you get other people to play the opposite roles or companion roles, and and see where it goes. It's wow, it's kind of letting yourself go uh, mm -hmm. in the movement of the social energy in that group. So, Darsha, can you explain? You know, this is not like following a script right so this isn't like a theater theater where you just follow a script right you're making or print out a script and everybody gets a role and, and do that. this is a bit different yeah and i think you you can uh do a google search and you'll find a sociodramatic play um different things people are doing with it often it's with children in classrooms even where they act out the social studies uh, or historical figures or whatever um, period of, of history they're studying. Um, but, you know, that just gives you ideas about how you can do it at home. And we have some other things uh, coming up for families. Yes, and I, in my experience with children, I've um, 
see, especially with younger children, they love to say, let's all be lions. Let's all be a group of a specific animal or something like that. So this is similar yeah. and, and very healing. Uh, we have uh, then another uh, orientation to play is called Original Play by Fred Donaldson. And this is uh, something he um, experienced with animals. He, he would play with animals, wild animals. Uh, and with kids and kids with uh, issues and, or, and have community play groups. And this is uh, his idea, uh, the way he talks about it is, is that play is a sacred force that really permeates our existence, our ground of being, that life abounds with playmates everywhere. You can see play happening. Uh, you can play with a leaf, uh, a child even says a chromosome. I'm not sure how you do that. Uh, and he calls it the forgotten language of God. And this is Lawrence Vanderpost, who spent a lot of time in Africa with um, small band hunter-gatherer folks who play all the time, as we've said. And this uh, kind of openness to being in the moment, and it grows your true self. Your, you know, you don't even know yourself unless you've played. It seems, uh, and it's it doesn't uh, attack anybody's defenses or bring up defenses. Uh, it might if you if it triggers something for you, but <clears throat> it creates an environment. Original play creates an environment where you drop your shields and share with your tender heart, and so you kind of just roll over on each other and this. If you look up Fred Donaldson's uh, original play, YouTube videos, you'll see it's just like people, he just like a big bear, you know, lets the kids climb all over him and then they'll, you know, just roll around. And uh, it's a lot of touching and um, interacting heart to heart in a trusting kind of uh, situation. You know, and as you're, you're talking about this, it reminds me of uh, so much of the ethnographic research. I mean, we keep saying, and small band hunter gathers play is happening all the time, but it's happening all the time as you know they're going about doing their work, you know, which they, they don't even think of it as work, right? Because they're having such a good time doing it, you know, they're walking through the forest and singing little songs and making up um, funny riddles, laughing back and forth with each other, you know, as they're as they're doing some work, they're going going to a hunt or this or that. And so um, I think that is such a great thing to learn that it's you know permeating every aspect of the day that and it gives a sense, um, you know, uh, of trust and it gives a sense of uh, being relaxed as you go about from day to day. And you're not alone. You always have your group or your uh, friends, or even if you play in nature, you have the natural world as your uh, relations, right? So you're making me think of uh, situations where uh, Westerners have gone into societies where, or places in Africa, for example, where water is hard to get. And the, the tradition for a group was to spend a few hours walking to a watering hole. Mm -hmm. And the Westerners thought, oh, that's terrible. Uh, here, we'll dig you a well. <laughs> we'll dig you a well. And so they dig the well. And the result is the society sort of uh, threads of, of social connection are torn a bit because they spent those hours having fun talking to each other all the way there. And it was just a bonding, uh, you know, a uniting experience. And now that's gone because the well's right here. So I think uh, I, we have to think when we're coming in from the outside to a culture, what what kind of impact our actions are going to have? So, absolutely, morning. And what we can learn from other cultures to see how in their day to day activities they're a strengthening relationships as they go about their job, not just I got to get this done today, you know. <laughs> A value difference. Thank you. <laughs> a value difference there. So efficiency for the Western world typically, and for them, relationships. Mm -hmm. Whatever fuels and feeds the relationships and the bonding is more important than anything else. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit more about original play? Well, he again, Fred Donaldson has kind of this mystical language. It's simultaneously inside of all life and beyond all separations which is, whoa, <laughs> out there, right? But it promotes, as we've been saying, this belonging, a connection, partnership, and your ability to take risk, to accept the other person's behavior and yield 
and be flexible to what they're doing, right? So you have to always be adjusting and adapting, as you've said. Uh, and to you want to do two looks. Um, he calls the first look here, this is Western look, right? This is the Westerner who categorizes everything. So when you meet somebody, you uh, maybe have automatic schemas or conceptual structures that you, you notice are they male, female, handsome, not handsome, um, fatter than me, thinner than me, whatever it is that you've been practicing all your life are important things. So if your mother always told you, oh, you're getting too fat, that would become a, um, or watch out how much you eat because you don't want to get too fat. That would be a chronic, what we call a chronic accessibility uh, construct <clears throat> that you'll apply wherever you go without even knowing you're doing it. And so that's this categorizing uh, look, which he says, okay, you got that one. Now go to the second look. So the first one is more left brain because the left brain loves to categorize and separate everything into pieces. Uh, and the second look is seeing with the heart, which is more of the right brain, the greater senses, like who is this person? What spirit, what kind of uh, climate do they bring to me, to the situation? Uh, what are they, um, how are they connected to the greater um, world and what are their gifts? And so it's more of an open, you know, how are they beautiful uh, kind of way of being with others. And that's where he, he wants, he, he says that original play um, takes mm -hmm. part. <clears throat> yes, and I think, you know, one of the the outcomes of this is, as you know, saying it's building a sense of connection and belonging and partnership is that specifically with children, you're communicating over and over and over again, you know, you can tell me anything, your feelings are valuable, you know, it's not only giving them a sense of belonging and acceptance, but also it's this future invitation that's building that, you know, you can come to me, I will receive you, <laughs> you know, and those, those are so, so critical, um, those deep messages. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so it's a kind way of being with others, promotes a loving relationship, allowing each of us to open up and actually find ourselves because it takes a long time to find yourself in a culture that tells you don't be yourself, right? So play, original play is intended to let yourself come out. Mm -hmm. And the acceptance, like we said before, of mistakes, right? So then to be able to communicate, oh, I made a mistake. And then you know, you have a sense that, oh, it'll be accepted and it'll be okay. Yeah, if you actually accidentally poke somebody in the eye or something, right? Oh, I didn't mean to do that, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what uh, he then tells us is that original play transforms aggression and it brings about positive effects. So there's an alternative to aggression and violence, provides alternatives to um, without the need for revenge. You, have, you don't need that um, in the way you react. It uh, doesn't have to be aggressive, right? It's, um, you learn other ways to push back or to be with another person who seems to be aggressive perhaps. And it creates then this safe space for practicing different ways of being that are not aggressive. And it can transform negative habits. If you've been aggressive and punching people as you're the way you play, this can transform that into more positive ways. Yeah, I'm even just thinking about, you know, Alan Kasdan's work um, and he uses play. So he's expert on, um, different type of behavior problems, especially with aggression in kids. And one of the things that he does with them is he says, when you're calm and collected, let's play like you're having um, an outburst, you know, and you go through it <laughs> in a playful way to be able to say, okay, now what are your options? How, what can you do with this here or there? Um, so anyways, very important. And there are also other positive effects too, right? Yeah, so, so um, just to go on what you were saying about um, possible ways to play. Um, so if, if your child uh, sometimes has problems going to bed at the right time or the time you uh, set up, um, you could practice that then at another time as um, a way to be you know, proactive about it. All right, let's pretend now that I'm you and I don't wanna go to bed and you be me, right? And you practice that and you do it different, you know, have different outcomes and different 
And the child then learns that, oh, there's other alternatives or there's, you know, it's not so bad to go to bed because, you know, I cooperate with my parent. Mm -hmm. Right, and giving them say, okay, now we're gonna have a temper tantrum by going yeah. to bed. You play that out and we're not good. Now we're gonna <laughs> do this, have a positive outcome, that type of thing. Yeah. Yep. So the positive effects of original play then is uh, build self-esteem for self and maintains it um, for self and others. And it's optimally um, conducive to learning and creativity, promotes belonging, as we keep saying. Mm -hmm. and again, we also keep saying it, uh, it facilitates adaptation in new situations and environments. And, you know, one of the things I think we haven't said, but that's really important, is learning the boundaries of self and others you know, by you, you push those boundaries and you experience the boundaries around you when you play and what is mine and what is yours and how those go back and forth. And so that's so important for building the sense of self and identity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if, uh, if you watch animals play like uh, monkeys or puppies or kittens, uh, once in a while you hear a Yes. As an indicator that you've gone too far, play partner, pull back, right? Mm -hmm. so if, if the play partner, the play partner will pull back typically, right? If they don't, the play is over because they they don't want to play with someone who's hurting them, right? So you okay. learn what the boundaries are in that way too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see that that sense of self, that core of self is really at the heart of thriving and well-being and the jeopardizing that sense of self over and over again, you see leads to all kinds of pathologies. So it's so important for having an understanding of, of self and other, and you learn that through play. Yeah. So attachment play is another uh, term that Aletha Solter has uh, coined. And she talks about attachment play as a non-competitive, child-centered, so because this is parents and children, uh, a kind of play that involves laughter usually it can take place anywhere. There's no particular equipment or rules, doesn't teach aggression or competition, and doesn't involve any belittling, that kind of teasing, or forced tickling. So th those are sort of the parameters of attachment play. Yeah, so this makes me think that we haven't said this prior, but we're not talking about sports. Right. We're not talking about, you know, a set game with rules and that that has some benefits. OK, but this type of attachment and social play is a different type of play. Right. So the free play we're talking about, social free play is not in uh, playing uh, soccer or tennis or badminton or anything else. Um, football. This is social free play. Right. So it's creative. It's whole. It's whole body. Uh, so it's not playing a board game. It's not playing chess or other games. Hard games. Yeah. yeah. And again, and, go ahead. No, I was going to ask. I was going to ask you. It can reduce stress, right? <laughs> yep. And we've sort of been saying these kinds of things: solve behavior problems, bring joy, strengthen attachment between parents and children, and whoever's playing gets more strongly attached in this kind of play. Mm -hmm. And the cooperation, I think we haven't reiterated that enough, but, you know, because you're building relationships and all of these pro-social hormones are flowing, everything you play and play and play. And then, of course, cooperation between the child and the parent just it grows and grows and grows. And because children need to play, they have the urge to play, they need to get that urge out and then they'll be more cooperative after. So Al, uh, uh, Salter uh, talks about nine forms of attachment play. There's non-directive child centered oh, play. Good. These are so good, Darsha. We have so great. <laughs> <clears throat> and so these are um, where you non-directive child centered play is where the parent provides materials and then sort of just sits back and lets the child lead in whatever play happens. Symbolic play, you can have particular props or themes. So this is where you could have a uh, going through the reluctance to go to bed and, and act it out or whatever it is. It could be toilet training or lying or sibling rivalry, that kind of thing. Contingency play is uh, something where the, the child takes an action and the adult responds. So 
you do this with babies. Babies say ga, and mom or dad say ga back, and then ga ga, and then ga ga, and then back and forth and back and forth. So that's play, contingency, contingency play. Or if you're carrying the child on your back, uh, and the child will uh, hit your left shoulder to make you go left, or the right shoulder to make you go right, that's contingency play. Also, um, <clears throat> a pillow fight, perhaps, where the, the child hits the parent with the pillow and the parent just falls over. Right? <laughs> uh, the kids like that a lot. <laughs> Row reversal. <laughs> Sure. And nonsense plays like topsy turvy stuff, like putting your pants on your head or saying things backwards or being really silly and exaggerating. And uh, so, all these things are, you know, wonderful ways to connect and also transform. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there's more. So, I the nine forms. So, these are the first four. Here are the other ones. So separation games like peekaboo when you have a baby, um, chase or tag, or hide and seek. So that al these allow the child to deal with anxieties of separation, and learn the you know that you'll still be there or they'll be okay. Paw reversal. This is where the pillow fight thing <laughs> come in. The adult pr pretends to be weak, ignorant, clumsy, or scared, and the child gets to be the strong player, right? And so that's very uh, refreshing to a child who's been getting frustrated with all sorts of rules and, and not being able to do what they want. Regression games are when you uh, play, uh, <clears throat> let the child be a baby, for example, a five-year-old acting like a baby and talking baby talk or wanting to cuddle all the time and act like a baby. Sometimes this happens with when the sibling is born um, or other traumas or other um, scary things happen. Uh, I put a note here, though. Remember, cuddling is good for everybody, no matter what. <laughs> and then there are activities that involve body contact, like wrestling and tag, ca uh, catch, tag and catch. So you uh, tag them and then grab them, right? Dancing in arms, carrying, you know, dancing with the baby or, or young child, wheelbarrow, piggyback riding, and games where you hold hands. I mean, it depends. The kids, uh, every child is a little bit different of which kind they like. And we'll have some suggestions for one of the books we'll suggest is really about a lot of body contact things you can do. And then cooperative games where you make up a story together, you play folk song games like Farmer and the Bell or London Bridge is Falling Down. And uh, you can convert games into cooperative games, sport games, or there are, are board games that are cooperative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are so great. This is so these slides are the how to. <laughs> yeah, what you can do. Yeah. Oops. So when you are in attachment play, she has these rules that she suggests. So follow the child's lead and remain flexible. And you want to go through them, Mary? Sure. Um, and I think these are so important because. Uh, we, I think we can forget as adults, you know, we, there's a power dynamic there. And so it takes a surrendering and a letting go and an open heartedness to the child receiving what they're, whatever they're going to say. And so sometimes those broad terms can be hard to implement, but these simple rules help you keep in mind what those mean. So the first one is, you know, really following the child's lead and, and, and remaining flexible. And so not um, correcting them on how they're supposed to use a toy or where they're supposed to go, just really following their lead. So avoiding teaching or correcting the child and interrupting or analyzing the play. So that's something that um, adults can do really easily like, oh, well, is, you know, this toy is supposed to be used in this way or you know, what will happen if we do this over here? It, it, that's a different type of play, <laughs> you know? Uh, it, it's not um, analytical, you know, and follow the laughter. So if laughing is going on, this means it's a good indication this is right, this is, things are going in the right direction. And of course, avoid teasing, avoid tickling. And um, obviously, you know, timing is important. So don't be trying to play when your child is upset or crying, right? You wanna be responsive and tend to the child's needs. And you need to obviously seek professional help for major trauma 
And it's also okay to say that you don't want to play sometimes. So, you know, it's um, for, for it to be play and for attachment play, there is a sense of reciprocity. So both the adult and the child are coming together willingly <laughs> and want, want to engage in this type of play. So you have to respect the child as well in that. All right, and then uh, one more a slide about, uh, this one is about solo play among babies. Um, sometimes, ideally, babies are not alone <laughs> and they're not left alone, but they, if you are gonna leave babies alone, the Resources for Infant Educators, RIE, uh, which is mentioned at the bottom, has, uh, uh, is very intelligent about how to do this with respect and with, um, uh, sensitivity to attachment and to um, development. And so letting babies be in the sun, for example, as this picture is showing, um, and let them be outdoors under uninterrupted in their play, as long as they're happy, you know, with a, in their video that there's a link there, the child has a, a metal bowl and the sun is in it and the child is moving the bowl, the baby, uh, and making, um, Hmm. reflections. <laughs> uh, and that's very interesting, right? It's building the scientific mind in a way. Mm -hmm. So for short periods of time, I sure. think uh, right. it's okay to have babies playing by themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, finally, then these are the books that we would recommend. There's attachment play, which we discussed. And then these other two by uh, Leonard Lawrence Cohen. Uh, the Art of Rough Housing has all sorts of movements and things of uh, what you do to play court, uh, good old fashioned horseplay with young children. It shows you exactly how to hold the child in ways that are uh, not hurting uh, and helpful and all that. And then playful parenting is really a very detailed, uh, just like attachment play, detailed ideas for how to play with kids and when and how to heal different kinds of problems. and. And Darsha, do you have a recommendation for adults who want to engage in social play or to begin implementing uh, ways of playing? Well, the book that I was, we were talking about earlier is The Art of Play. So that's the sociodramatic. Mm -hmm. Did you have any ideas, Mary? I think that's a great one. Okay. Good. All right. Well, thank you very much, folks. Uh, this is more information here. Find us at evolvenest.org. And uh, yes, we got a, a hooray there from the dog. <laughs> he really was very happy. Uh, says goodbye to you, too. So here are the references. We'll just leave them here for a second. You can stop the video if you want to look more. And thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.